Hey everybody, it's Mama K coming at you again from Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada. And today I have one of the most special people in my life that I met. We're trying to figure it out, I think around 18 years ago in a whole other life. Um, and this person has continued to be a source of joy and fun and inspiration and just an, an really an incredible human being that um, I, I really don't know where I'd be in life without. So without further ado, special guest, who are you? Well, my name is Mitch Dorge, and, um, and what do I do? That's, that's an interesting question. You know, when you sent me this and you said, what do you what do? You do? Uh, wow, what do I do? Uh, who is Mitch Dorge? And, and I, every now and again, uh, trying to put that and encapsulate that. So one, I guess you could say I'm, I'm a drummer. That's, so first and foremost, I'm, I'm a drummer. Uh, second, uh, I guess you could say an, an educator of sorts. Um, try to work out as a motivational speaker, somewhat of a, uh, I, I guess, a perceived rock star in terms of my position with uh, drummer, the drum throne with Crash Test Dummies. Um, you know, father of two, uh, curator of, of many animals, and a lover of life. Does that, does, that, does that encapsulate it somewhat? I think that's pretty accurate. <laughs> awesome. And did you okay. say composer? I think that you've composed some Yes, uh, yeah, film film composer, film uh I, I would like a film composer and uh and uh, uh post production artist, I guess you could say. Uh so in terms long, of I I Go ahead. How long have you been making music as your career for? Uh this would be well uh, making my music for a career. So I started playing drums when I was six. Um, I'm 60 this year, so that's, you know, there's, there's 54 years. But in terms of my musical career, I, I, I <clears throat> it's a difficult, you know, where's that transition point? I'm, I'm not 100% sure. I, I don't know that I ever thought I had any other options. Um, when I was when I was in school, let's say when I was 13 or 14 years old in particular, because that's when I started playing in bands and stuff. Um, I, I really I really thought that this is the way that I was just going to spend the rest of my life. I'd, I wouldn't say that I approached it with the idea that I, I was going to make money doing this. Because at 14, I don't know that that necessarily means anything to you. But I, I was I was definitely at that position where this is a lot of fun. I really like this. It really I wouldn't have had the intellect back then to think that this really pulls at my at my creative strings, uh, but, but what it, it was it was fun and I enjoyed it and I loved playing and I loved expressing myself. So uh, where the point was where I was going to make this a career would probably be around seventeen or eighteen. I, I would I would imagine because that's that's when that's when your parents are asking you questions like, do you want to go to university or do you want to, you know? And and of course I got what every other 16 year old gets and, and that's that you know you got to go to university you got to have something to fall back on music is a really nice thing but what are you going to do for money and all that kind of stuff and uh, at that point in time my reply would have been well this is what I'm going to do like what else what else would I do I, I, I don't, I'm not interested in doing anything else this is really what I want to do and as, and as long as I could pay my rent and, and uh, at that time you know pay my insurance on my car uh, which I, you know, I had no floorboards in my car. I had, it was just a piece of junk, but it got me from gig to gig. And that's all I was concerned with. Um, so I guess, yeah, six, 17, 18 years old. That's when, that would be when I said, this is what I'm going to do. Uh, come hell or high water. And, and I, you know, and I, and I did everything. Like I did everything. I, I took every gig that came my way, whether it was country, whether it was rock, whether it was jazz. Uh, you know, I tried doing studio gigs. I tried doing theater stuff. Like whatever came my way, I took it, I embraced it. And I, and I said, I, I think I can do this. I truly sucked at a lot of it. Um, there's some stuff that I should never have tried. I probably would have done myself a, a service by not trying. But I, I felt that if I was going to make a living doing it, I, I had to do everything that came my way. And, uh, you know, and I taught for a number of years. I taught at major minor music for a number of years. And, uh, and I learned quite quickly that that, I, I don't know that that was the, the way that I wanted to spend my career, but I was still, I, I was teaching and I was playing and I was playing between students and I, and I, and I was able to earn some money so that I could go out and, and play the shows that weren't paying very well. 
So um, that was a really long winded answer, but I would say, you know, maybe 17, let's use that number. That's when I made the decision that this was going to be my career. Oh, and there's your pups. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So someone's probably outside. Um, so when did things sort of turn around for you in regards to having to take the, the gigs that weren't so great to it really, you really seeing that you were enjoying everything that you did? Um, I was really fortunate in, in that a lot of the bands that I was able to play with, um, I guess you could say were, were progressive bands of the time. So as an example, one of, one of the first bands that I, that I, I played out with, not the bands that we played in the basement with, but bands that I actually played with that, that earned some money were, were pretty progressive at the time. So we were playing stuff like Steely Dan, right? Where, where I really, really had to dig into what the groove was and, 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 and uh, really had to learn arrangements for songs. And, and there was a real call for dynamics and, and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, from, from playing with a, with a few bands like that and, and playing, say, high caliber music, not, not to say that, it, that you know, anything else is less than high caliber, but you know what I mean, it, it, you know, in terms of, of really digging in, uh, digging into my musicianship, right? Um, and then I, I got involved with, a, with another band, with, which was Bob Fuhr. Uh, now, at the time, Bob Fuhr was like the, the Miles Davis of, 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 of Winnipeg. I got to play with these people. So I, I was, I was, um, I, I got to bypass the, the top 40, the, the, the top 40 stretch. Uh, like I had a lot of friends that were making a living in the, in the bars and stuff like that, but, but we were just doing top 40. They weren't coming home going, wow, I really dug in tonight and I feel really great about what I was playing. Um, so I, 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 and not that there's, Again, I don't want to put a stigma on it, say that it's because someone's playing, doing the right thing. Um, but in those days, you know, playing top 40 was, was, was a way to earn an income and it wasn't necessarily digging into your ability as, as, as a musician. So I, I did a lot of those things. Um, now, of course, not everybody wants to go out and hear Steely Dan, right? So <laughs> uh, we, we weren't, weren't making a lot of money, but it was, it was, putting me into studio situations and it was putting me into, you know, a lot of CBC work and it was putting me into a lot of, uh, you know, people hiring me to play on their records and stuff like that. So I was able to, to irk, irk out a living. And I would probably say that it got me into a lot of bands that were getting paid more than scale at the time. And uh, even still, you know, I, I had to do, uh, I had to do a morning session, an afternoon session, an evening session, and then I had to go play my top 40 gig at night to to make enough to, to, to earn a living. Uh, but it really turned uh, around with a band called, of all things, a band called Nouveau Station Wagon, which was a, a band that we put together to play at the Festival de Voyageur, which really at the time was a license to print money. Uh, the band was just so much fun. Everywhere we went, it was so much fun. And people came out and had fun with us. The problem was, is that we were spread out. Our guitar player was fan from Vancouver and the fiddle player was from Nova Scotia. So, and everybody in, spread out in between. So in order for us to get together, it cost a fortune. So we, we couldn't keep that going. But wouldn't you know it, um, a little band which got a record deal halfway through called Crash Test Dummies called me up one day and said, hey, uh, we've auditioned a bunch of drummers. None of them are really working out. We're going down to do a showcase in the Cayman Islands. Can you help us out? <laughs> really? Can I go to Cayman Islands? So uh, we, I, I went off and, and I said, wow, these, these are a lovely bunch of people with their heads on straight, like they weren't being rock stars. And, uh, I, and I never looked back. So that turning point would probably be when, when Crash Test Dummies came along. Otherwise, I, I would, you know, I would have spent, a, I, I wouldn't have gone out of the music industry. I would have stayed in. The, um, and I would also say that working with Crash Test Dummies, going into the studios and, and I, I became producer for Crash Test Dummies and stuff like that. And, and uh, that really upped my, my skills in terms of, of working uh, with production like movies and bands and stuff like that so you know that just kind of brought everything up a whole notch from there am i being too long-winded i hope not no not at all no not at all 
Um, and I know that you have been really, really great with helping bands that are up and coming now, um, been so kind and supportive of them and helping them uh, sort of find their, find their way. And so thank you for that on, on, at least from what I saw all those years ago. So I yeah, you know, I, I, I tried. There's, there's, there's two things that come with that. The one thing being is that I, I've always, um, my approach to that has always been to say, who's, who is the artist and, and uh, what is the artist trying to portray? And, and how can I try to focus that to be what, what the artist wants to be, as opposed to what's my vision as to what the artist should be. And, uh, and I think along with that comes the expectation that, well, hey, you play for a famous band, by being associated with you, we're automatically gonna, we're automatically gonna, to, to gonna make that jump to the next level that we wanna be at. And, and it, it's really hard to tell people that, you know what, it, it doesn't matter who I am, you you've there's there's so much more that you have to have you know you have to be able to uh it, it, you might look at us as being rock stars on the road and stuff like that but it, it's an incredible amount of work like it's it's you know there are, our, our days are, are 14 16 hours long sometimes and and you know making a record is is 20 hour days and and uh the the um you know the discipline the the expectations everything else like you you have to you have to pull it out from yourself. It, it doesn't come to you. And uh, sometimes people think that, oh, okay, I'm working with this guy and, uh, and, and my music, I'm happy with the way my music has come across. But there's, there's so many things that I can't do. You know, I can't promote you. Um, you know, you, you got to show up to the gig and you got to be on time and you got to be professional and you got to know what all those things are. Uh, I, I can't give you that, right? And, and no matter how good your music is, you still got to deliver. You still got to show up. You still got to be on time. You still have to treat people like people. Uh, you, you have to do all of these things that I can't do for you. And, and so I think sometimes people walk away from that going, well, we worked with this guy, but you know, no one came and, and handed us a record deal. I don't know what, what we're doing wrong. You know, it's like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, no kidding. So now I'm going to jump backwards a little bit. Um, Go ahead. I want to know just just in that time from when baby Mitch started playing or little Mitch at age of six to when you started gigging, what was that like? Who did you study with? Why did you choose drums? Uh, well, drums was a natural. Drums was the thing that uh, I was I was always playing on pots and pans or on the table. I was that kid in the restaurant with my north my my north my my knife and fork playing on 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 tables and glasses and plates. And I, I was that annoying kid. And I was the kid that played on the headrest right behind my dad. And I was always banging on things. And uh, my sister took piano lessons. And one day we were taking her to piano lessons. And my dad said, "You know, your mom and I have been talking. I think it's time you learn how to play an instrument. What instrument do you want to play?" Kind of thought it was obvious, but I was only six. So we we got um, we we got a set of drums. I don't know where Dad got them from, but they were they were uh, red sparkle, and uh, there was no floor tom, which kind of annoyed me. I only had a hi hat, a snare drum, and a, and a bass drum, and I think I had a tenor tom. And my cousin Raymond came over, and uh, he knew how to play that opening fill from Hawaii Five O, and uh, and I and I I thought he was a rock star because he could play that that thing. At least to me, it was it was accurate. I don't know how good it was, but to me, it was. And uh, so uh, my father's deal was, we'll get you drums, but you have to take lessons. No lessons, no drums. You know, okay, that's fine. Uh, so um, there used to be a place called Civic Music School, which used to be on Marion. Uh, I, I don't really know whatever happened with it, but like most places, I, I went in and, and the, the style of teaching back then was, you know, here's, here's our, here's our book and we're going to open it up and we're going to learn the rudiments of, of drums and stuff like that. So, something that wasn't very fun for, because I wanted to play Hawaii Five-O. I, I didn't want to go mama, data, mama, data, single stroke roll and paradiddle. And uh, that wasn't of any interest to me at all. Um, I wanted to play Hawaii Five-O. So uh, it didn't take very long. And, and I, you know, I wanted to quit there. And so, you know, my dad said, well, you know, no lessons, no, no drums. And so we had to find a different place to learn how to, to learn to play. And eventually I ended up over at uh, Colt Music, which was on Provence at the time. And uh, my drum teacher, Brian, uh, came to me and said, 
well, what do you want to play? And, and I, I just come from a couple of years of mama, dada, mama, dada, mama, dada, and rudiments. And I, I said, well, what do you mean? What do I want to play? So well, what's your favorite song? I don't know. <laughs> what? You mean I get to play a song? And um, I wish I could tell you what song that we, that we played. And I, 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 I can't remember, but it, it was, it would have been like a rock tune. It would have been like, uh, um, oh, I, I, you know, maybe like uh, house of the rising sun or something like that, uh, that, I, that we could play with. And he had a record player and we could try and play with it. And, and that was, that was amazing. And so he was, he was my guiding light because he, he found the thing that sparked me to, to want to go home and play what I was learning. Uh, you know what I mean? Like it's, it's like when you're in school and you're assigned to read a book and write an essay about something that you're just not interested in. It's hard. So even though I loved playing drums, I didn't want to come home and play mama data. I, so, so now I found somebody that um, hit my, my creative nerve. Um, unfortunately he was a player, so he needed to go out and earn a living. And so he stopped teaching. And, and so I, Gord was my, was my next teacher. I wish I could remember their last names. And uh, Gord was the same way. He said, okay, what do you want to play? And uh, so here was another guy that we, you know, we took records and we started playing with records. And uh, it was right around that time that I changed teachers again. And um, I can't remember Brian's last name, but uh, Brian was, I guess his background was more jazz. And it was right around that time that I was learning about people like, like Buddy Rich and Tony Williams and, and, um, I'd probably say more so Tony Williams and people like Billy Cobham and stuff like that. And so it was the right transition. And, and so he was teaching me about, about jazz and, and what that meant. But the thing is, is that he was teaching me about something that I was interested in because I had found other people that were playing that style of music. And so it was, it was a perfect time to, to be slipping in, in, into there. And, um, but by that time I was, I was really, um, I needed to go out and play and spend less time being taught. I needed to go out and, and, and apply these things that, that I was doing. And uh, lucky me, uh, at that time, it was myself, uh, Gilles Fournier, and uh, we would spend, li literally, I, we would, I would get to Larry's at about 10, and, and we would play till, till 10 p.m., midnight, all day long. That, that's what we did. We we sat down with Chick Corea records and 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 uh, um, you know Keith Jarrett records and like it just all these all these amazing artists. Weather Report and and we would practice uh, 12, 14 hours a day for for months, and and uh, we lived it for for such a long time. And that was that was an amazing uh, learning experience in 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 terms of uh, I don't know because I can't say who specifically taught me. But being working with people that were like-minded in terms of what we were trying to create was was a huge, huge, huge lesson, and uh, and then from there on I started, you know, learning, uh, you know, learning material became my greatest teacher, and uh, but it didn't stop there because when when we started touring with the dummies, for, for instance, if I'd be in New, be in New York or something, I, I would I would call down Drummers Collective and say who's available I, I i need to have my head twisted around here a little bit and so i would go down and and it would be you know i remember going in and uh i was hoping to get a lesson with kim plainfield at the time and uh kim wasn't there and they said well you can see and you think i can remember his name no but i i, I went in and i had a lesson with a fellow that um, completely introduced me to a whole new way of looking at my instrument and and so you know, and now going out and, and watching people play and uh, they don't have to be professionals. They can be the, the school jazz band, but there's a lot of talent out there and I get to see people playing stuff or approaching things in a way that I wouldn't. And, and so I learned from that. Uh, again, long winded answer. And I, I hope I didn't get off track. I tried to stay on the, on the, on the learning track there, but. I'm just trying to imagine the three of you as teenagers, you and Larry and Jill, that's, wonderfully terrifying uh, yeah i guess it would be you know uh larry was as driven then as he is now probably more driven then um jill was just a talent i mean he was he would have been 14 or 15 at the time and and uh but just just a just a talent 
right? I mean, we, we, we just we sit, sit down and, and, uh, and everybody was driven um, to, to find a bunch of 15 year olds, 16 year olds that were driven. Uh, it, was, it was amazing. And it was like, it was nothing. Nobody was sitting there going, geez, what time is it? It was like, no, no, no. Hey, yeah, let's do this. Let's do that. And uh, you know, so playing with those two uh, and, and eventually Bill Spornitz came in into that picture as well. Um, yeah, playing in that situation was, was great. And of course, the, the, the mental torment in there because the three of us are a little left of center. <laughs> you found your people. Yeah, yeah. It was, it was, a, great, it was a, great, uh, a, a great time of my life and probably the highest curve of learning. So now remembering, of course, that this is a family interview, um, do you have a, would you be willing to share perhaps what one of your weirdest gigs or jobs has been over the years? Well, uh, there's, there's a number of them, um, but not for reasons that you would think. Um, the, probably the, there, there's two, two really weird ones. Uh, one, when we were playing with Bob Fuhr and the Stilettos, Bob Fear and the Stilettos, what, what we did was, is we, we, that was another band that we rehearsed 12 hours a day, 14 hours a day. We, and, and we were playing in the, this was in the Transcona Country Club. So we had, we had it for the summer and we, we would go in at nine o'clock in the morning and we'd be there at nine o'clock at night. And what we did is we took all Motown songs and, and brought them up to date. And uh, so this was, this was a band that, that, in the 80s playing Motown music that was brought up to the 80s. If you remember what the 80s music was like. And uh, of course, we, 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 we spent all this time. Bob Fear was high profile at that time. And so we had, we had good representation in terms of where we should play. And uh, someone thought it was a good idea that we played a, a social, someone's wedding social. And uh, what they wanted to hear at the wedding social was 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 Bon Jovi and and uh, other bands of of the eighties, and and we weren't that. And I think three songs in, and we were being pelted by little cheese balls. You know the little, <laughs> <sport>? <laughs> you know the you know the cheese things. That, yeah. So we were being pelted. Like people were 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 at the social taking their cheese thing. And we're not talking about a couple of them. No, like the stage was being littered with people throwing these little cheese things at us. And that, that was a real, that was a real wake up call because we, we thought that we were, you know, a band that was being progressive and, 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 you know, bringing something new to the table to be, you know, hammered by little cheese balls. You weren't giving um, the people what they wanted. Oh yeah, exactly. And, and that, and, and that, I mean, and that tells you no matter what your musical tastes are or what your abilities are, um, you'll get put in your place pretty quick. Right. I mean, you know, you can, you can go to McEwen and come back with your masters in jazz and, and, uh, and you might think that you're somebody, but when people don't want to hear what it is that you're given, you will eat a little cheese ball. Um, <laughs> Gives a whole new meaning to the word cheesy. <laughs> Parallel that now, go back and go forward a number of years to playing with Crash Test Dummies, who is a recording act, who is, you know what I mean? Like we're, we're top of the heap here. And we were playing a show in San Bernardino. And uh, again, this is, this is when somebody didn't quite plan things properly. And uh, we were playing with a bunch of, I guess, underground punk bands at the time. And um, there were... I, I'm going to say eight or 9,000 people at this event that we were playing at. We had no idea. We just knew that we were on the bill and, and we showed up and, and uh, there were these bands on before us. And, and uh, we were halfway through our second song and we started getting pelted by coins like quarters and nickels and, Ouch. and uh, well, yeah, we had like, you know, Brad had this really expensive guitar that he was playing and, and it was also, you hear this ting, toing, ping, ting. And they were hitting my cymbals and like, so people like hated us. They just hated us. And they're throwing all this, this stuff at us. So it's twice in my life I've had gigs where I've been pelted one by cheese and, and one by, um, small denominations of coins. Um, those those were the weirdest because because both times 
I was playing with bands that I was putting all my heart into and, and thought that we were, we kind of thought we were something. And, and we just got cut right down to the side. Yeah, you're two and a half seconds. Squished. Done, done. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The re reality came big, big time. So those so, were two. Other than having people having to wear armor on stage um, at unknown gigs like that or <laughs> gigs where you're not quite sure if you're at the right place, um, do you have any advice for students who might be thinking about going into music as a career? Well, that's kind of twofold. Um, one, I would say, um, never stop learning. Uh, everybody has something to give you, uh, no matter no matter who it is. Uh, you, it could be your professor, um, it could be a university professor, um, it can be your neighbor, the, the the guy playing at the local. The, uh, always, always keep in mind that everybody has something to offer you. Number one, uh, as an example, uh, sometimes you have to have a, a real proper look at things. Um, a student of mine, uh, Ted Crawford, went to Grant McEwen and um, he phoned me up one night. It was quite late. He was phoning me from a bar and, and saying, hey, you know what? I, I'm just, I'm, I've had a couple of drinks. I'm sorry for calling you, but I'm at, I'm at a club with a bunch of guys from school. And, and we're sitting around this table and we're watching this band and these guys are, are, are the lambasting them. Like they're, they're just making all these kind of comments about, uh, about these guys can't play. And, and the, the kind of thing that happens when you go to a school and, and right, you start propping yourself up and, and thinking that you know something. And uh, so my, my advice to him was go back to the table. And, and when they start panning the band, just, just ask them, right? Who's working? Who's drinking? Right? So all you guys that have your degrees and think that you're hot stuff, uh, you guys are sitting at a table. Those guys, no matter what you think of them, they're working. They're using their craft to earn a living. And, and so never, never think that you're, that you're more valuable than the guy who's on stage. Uh, you know, when you are, sitting next to your classmate in school who might be struggling or whatever uh, with with whatever their instrument is um, you know that person that that person has a unique way of looking at their instrument and and so contribute to what they're doing um, or learn from them uh, but never never put yourself above them always always realize that people have something to teach you uh, you can learn from anybody that, that's number one. Second is uh, you have to be willing to, to, to put in the work and, and maintain your integrity. What I mean by that is look forward to, to what inspires you and, and chase that. Because uh, what inspires you might not be the popular thing. Um, and, and so if it's not the popular thing, you might have some difficulty earning a living doing it. And you might have to do other things like I did. I mean, I, I, you know, I cleaned restaurants. I, I, I did whatever I had to do to be able to play uh, because I was playing in a, you know, in a band that was being pelted by cheese. So we weren't making a whole pile of money at the time. But I loved playing with that band. And, and, I, and I felt that it was, I was learning from it and I was growing from it. So I had to do other things so that I could do that thing. Um, now, the reason I say that is because if, if you if you constantly do things that you don't necessarily love doing, you're going to get bitter after a while. Um, you know, if you don't like playing lounge gigs, you, you're going to get bitter if you start playing lounge gigs for a long time. If you love playing lounge gigs, then then you should pursue that. But if you don't, uh, find the thing that you love and 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 chase it and 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 and, and enjoy doing that, because if something comes along someone comes along and says, hey, you do what you do really well, and I'd like you to come and do that with me. You're going to spend the next 20, 30 years of your life doing that thing. You better like it. So, so choose what you love. You know, um, I, I think that you love inspiring your students. You, you love when you see that light come on. And, and, right? and, and so you know, being, being, being who you are in the classroom um, lights you up and, 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 and when, when you have a student or students 
that the light comes on and, and you see the joy of music and you're able to share that with them, uh, that you love that. You, you, you just soak that up. And so every time that that happens, and I'm assuming it, it happens at least once a year where, where a student just, you just, you just watch the switch come on. Um, you know what I mean? It makes you look like you look right now. And, and, and so that's, that's what I think you, 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 you need to find. Um, it, understand whether or not it's a hobby or whether it's a pursuit. If it's a hobby, then, you know, let it, let it be a hobby and, and, and let it be the best hobby that you have. But if you're, if you're, if you're saying, I want to do something in the music industry, what is it, you know, how do I, how do I get there? Um, enjoy what you do, learn from everybody because you can and, and chase it with all of your heart, but, but be true to your heart. Don't, you know, don't, don't, don't play in a rock band if, if jazz is what your love is, or don't play in a jazz band if, if rock is what it is. Play in the jazz band because you're good at it and somebody says, here's a gig, but, but don't pursue that if your heart's not in it. Um, and, and I really think that that's important. Uh, I, I think we've all met band teachers in our lives that it's, it's my gig and I get the summers off. And, and um, you know, and, to those people, I mean, I'm not one of them. So, but in my mind, I, I'm saying shame on you. Uh, you know, those students deserve to be with someone who loves music and is trying to inspire them. So if being a band teacher is what you want, then you should pursue it. You should pursue it with everything that you have and, and, and be that person who's lighting the fire under people. If, being, if, if, if your desire is to go and play with Wynton Marcellus, then, you know, put things in place and be willing to put in the time to get you into that position to be there. And, and it's not just learning your craft. You know, it's, it's being a human being. It's learning how to show up on time. It's having a practice, a practice ethic. It's having a, a, a human ethic. It's all those kinds of things. So, um, so when I say it's twofold, I, I, one is understand what your desire is. And, and two, uh, never put yourself above anybody else everybody everybody has something to offer some people might not have you know i i had i have to work probably four times what what other drummers can do naturally uh you know i i have to sit down i have to i have to really work at it i have to you know i have to hate myself for a little while but then it clicks in i get it and okay now i can move on some guys just sit down and they just make it happen um but but as long as you're willing to put in the work, it, it will all come to you. Those are excellent words of advice. Um, I know I'll definitely take uh, take a lot of that back to me to the classroom. Even just that you can, there's always something to learn from every single person, right? I think there it's is. very easy for us to forget that when we get into our heads too much. So um, the last question I have for you, um, basically, this, besides the musical advice, do you have any worldly other advice for anybody who might be watching this during these weird times or even just any time? Well, right now, my pet peeve, if, if I had to have a pet peeve right now, is um, the amount of people that are looking at this whole isolation covid thing like it's some kind of disaster um it's it, it it's kind of an inconvenience until we figure things out but you know in 1929 um people didn't have the government have, uh enough money to to get through the next month and a half And that loaf of bread might have been pretty tough by then. Um, a lot, a lot of people faced some serious. Uh, this is a mild inconvenience for us. Um, everybody's trapped with 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 Netflix. <laughs> uh, you can still go outside for a walk. Uh, you can sit in your basement and you can play a, an instrument. You can read that book that you've always wanted. Th this is this is. You know, this is not the Spanish flu. Uh, it, it's an inconvenience, and and uh, and and we'll move we'll move forward to it. Um, people talking about being cooped up, really? You're, you're cooped up? Like, no, no, no. This is 
we, we have all, we have everything that life has to give us. Um, all we need to do is, is just like slow down for a little while. There's plenty of stuff that we can do. Uh, let's do it. Let's just be better human beings. Let's be, let's just read that book that we've always wanted to read. Let's spend that extra hour of practicing. Let's spend a few minutes sending an email uh, off to that friend that we haven't talked to for a while. We can do all of those things. It, it, I, I'm, I'm a little put off by the idea that people think these are tough times. Um, you know, go to into any hospital right now where someone is having respiratory problems or, or are being told by their doctor that, you know, you got to get your life in order or you got to get your things in order because, you know, there's an expiry date in your future. Those are real problems. Um, being asked to stay home so that we can slow down the onslaught of what's happening in the hospitals, really. And that's really what they're trying to do is, is we've only got so many hospital beds. Like I, I don't understand the, the problem here. <laughs> so, you know, my, my, my worldly advice, if I were to have any at, at all coming from, you know, drummer guy is, um, you know, enjoy life and, and really put it in perspective as, as the, you're, you, this is not, this is not as devastating as people say it is. Uh, if, if you're healthy, stay healthy, stay home, do what you got to do. Uh, go for a walk, train your dog, um, you know, that, that kind of a thing. Uh, keep life in perspective. Exactly. I would say that the biggest positive I've gotten out of having to stay home um, is getting to reconnect with friends through my interviews. And it's embarrassing that I don't take that time until I'm forced to take that time. Yeah. Um, so. Really, should you be embarrassed? You know, normally you're 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 um, you're being quite occupied with with uh, you know marking papers and and figuring out the next way to inspire the next student and 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 those kinds of things, right? You're you're um, you're figuring out your thing and in, in motivating people and and life and raising a daughter and and being a wife and, and your own individuality. I, um, a, a great story that came to a friend of mine from a friend of mine named Michel Akin came to me one day and he was talking about playing a gig and uh, a, a friend of his came out to, to the show. And uh, during the break, Michelle was, was wandering around as you do. Right. And, and saying hello to this person saying hello to that person. And, and, and then, oh, okay, got to go back on stage. Next day, he got a phone call from one of his friends saying, hey, I came out to see you last night and, and you came by my table and you said hello, but you kind of abandoned me after that. And I just want to let you know that I was hurt by that, which is great that he communicated that. But Michelle's response was, you have my phone number. Um, you know where I live. You, you, can, you can come by my house with pizza and, or come over for soup and, and, or have a beer or whatever. You can do that at any time when I'm playing in the clubs. I'm, I'm my, my gig is I, I have to go and, and the people that don't know me, the people that don't know where I live, the people that I, you know, so um, you're having a normal, you, you have an, a life and you're in, inspiring people and you're doing your thing. Now you have the time to go and and be with these other people i mean i am i'm you know be, because you don't call me once a week uh, no i'm offended no when i do hear from you i'm i'm overjoyed it's like this is this is amazing this is awesome because you took time away from inspiring other people to say hello to me uh so you should never you shouldn't be embarrassed by that, that that's you you are you are being you know super joanne well you are very kind and i hope that i have time in the future to do this more often no you will so thank you so much for spending time with me this morning um i i always love the time i get to spend with you you always make me smile you're one of those great people that i wish i had known longer but i'm so happy to know now well thank you and i forward that back to you <laughs> have a great rest of your day mitch too bye bye